we're going to talk about Aztec illumination. So if you are here for that, I'm here to teach it. Feel free to ask questions at any point. Um, I did put the um, Word document of the information into the RUM drive. Uh, so that's there now. So let me try to share screen. Okay, are we sharing good? My end. I have it on my end. Okay, so we should be good here. Okie dokie. So hi, I'm Isabel. Um, if you don't know me, I have emails out there. I'm the one doing all the Aztec stuff. Well, one of the eight in the known world that I know two in the mid realm and there's a couple playing around with some Incan and Mayan out there as well. So um, first we're going to do a little bit of kind of like a um, overview of where we're talking about. So <clears throat> we're talking about people uh, living in Mexico and Central America um, from the Gulf of Mexico towards the Pacific Ocean. Their territory stretched from modern day Veracruz into Guatemala and encompassed a territory of approximately 80,000 square miles. At the peak of their empire, which was considered to be 1430 to 1519, there were approximately 250,000 people just living in Tenochtitlan with an estimated population of 12 million and think Mexico City area. Um, there were a lot of little groups of people that got incorporated into the empire um, and they weren't all incorporated by fear and, and you know usurping. It a lot of times was a mutual uh, beneficial situation. The language they spoke is called Nahuatl. Um, there are a few things that tie over. Um, chocolate is one of our words that comes from there. Um, just as an example. And so here you have a little goddess sitting in her chair. The Aztec culture actually did interact with the Mayan culture in the 1200s um, at the Yucatan Peninsula area. Um, they know this because of the crossover in the language, and you will have some imagery that has a similar pattern to it or similar coloration because they did kind of mingle up some of their arts at this time. A lot of what we know about these cultures came from the arrival of Cortes in 1521. Um, a lot of the books, codices were destroyed by uh, the conquistadors because they were viewed as uh, not of religious acceptance. Um, so a lot of their books had to do with religious rituals. They worshiped approximately a thousand gods. There was a complex ritual for each season. They recorded gods and rituals in screenfold books. Um, in addition, the government had documents and historical references that they kept. And in a, a little bit, we'll see just how complex and detailed those documents are. Um, the artists that produce these are called uh, and individual scribes called Tlacuilos. And here you can see an image of one of the codices that is uh, screen folded. So you read right to left, flip, read right to left. <clears throat> so we know this is uh, Hernando Cortes. He came through. Um, if something was found to be not of religious or um, almost military in nature, it was burned. Um, and what we'll see is some of the codex, 
some of the codices that came um, from this time actually have Spanish translations of dates and people and animals on the sides of the manuscript. <clears throat> so this image here shows us where we're we're looking at, and you can see some of the smaller um, tribes that were incorporated into um, the Aztec nation. So here's your, um, this is an example of one of the pictures of one of the gods. Okay, so down to the nitty gritty, the types of documents that we see. There are about 20 pre-Columbian uh, Mesoamerican codices, about 500 codices from the time period from the 16th to the 18th century. Um, and those are ones that will usually have the Spanish notations. Um, we're gonna look at, at what types of documents these are. Some of these documents are Tonapoi. These are calendars with rituals, sacred animals and birds for each day, and a monthly god or goddess to whom sacrifices should be made. Um, there's a portion called the Tonomal uh, that shows the lunar deity um, and its cycle there. And again, these are screen folded. One example is the Codex Borbonicus. This is my personal favorite. The imagery is just stellar. Um, it's dated approximately 1507, which is just about close to the Cortez um, invasion, if you will. Um, they would have been uh, constructed by high priests and then folded um, about 40 pages here. They measure approximately uh, 40 centimeters square. And the first portion of those is the tonal model. The tonal model has 18 divisions that correspond to the solar year with each cycle having a distinct name and its own deity. The second part is the tonapui a count of days containing 20 named days in 13 day rotations, resulting in 260 day cycles. Each of these has days with corresponding birds and corresponding Lord. Oops, my bad. The central figure in the plate we're gonna look at next is the Aztec God known as the Maze God. This guy right here, back. He is the god of winter, of ice and frost. So when you look at this image, I'm gonna to flip to it a second. What all are some of the things that we see that could give us an indication of um, what time of year this might be? Anyone can answer. The colors. Anyone? Cooler colors than warmer. I see why you're saying that, but no. Here's your big clue right in the center. This is a wheat chaff. And if you look, um, there are, um, in some of them, there'll be corn, pictures of corn. Um, but here is your um, main indicator. This is November, October-ish area. Um, you've got the, the, fi the ice coming in, the corn god, um, the frost. So this is when this would approximately be to our calendar. In this one, you can see this is the center portion. This shows you the God of the month. 
this shows you the rituals that need to be done and the types of things that you should be sacrificing to the God. You can also see here that you have a Spanish, um, it's almost a Spanish secretary hand here that is describing what this is. This is actually a jug of water right here. So it's pretty, when you know what the symbols mean, you can pretty well identify, and identify that on any document of that culture. The, I'm trying to move this here so I can see what I'm doing. The area that's around here, those are the days. Okay. So you've got the god or goddess in each picture. You've got the sacred animal in each picture. And as if anyone's into biology, you can tell what these are. This is a salamander and this is a snake. I mean, down to almost the, the exact species. Um, this is a deer and a rabbit and a conch snail. And this is, uh, that one's a dog. So you can tell up here, they have birds. There's an owl, um, different species of parrot. And then these numbers, that's your number, what we would call the number day, the first day, second day, third day, see the circles? Those are the, the count of the day. So there's a big book of these that are screen folded. Um, another similar um, codex is the Codex Borgia. It's a little bit earlier, um, but again, you have your God, your sacred animal, and then what you should be doing in each of its blocks. So the imagery is quite interesting. Here is a, a scorpion, because those are common down there. The Codex Borgia um, is a pre-Columbian 2260 day ritual calendar with a screen fold arrangement. You read it from right to left on one side, then you flip the whole document and read it right to left on the other. Anybody have questions yet or? I could babble all day long about this stuff. The last um, calendar type I'm gonna show you is the Fersavari Meyer Codex. Um, this one is a tonopoe that shows the 260 day cycle. Um, in this page, the trees here, these blue trees and these two white trees um, are your compass directions surrounded by the fire god. Um, this is one of 22 pages in this text um, that are, um, the whole thing is about 390 centimeters. Um, the approximate date of this codex is between 14 and 1521. And even in this one, you can tell that not only do they re represent the compass directions, but you can tell what season we're talking about. So you got the pretty flowers here. So that's, you know, your, your springy. And here you got your summery. Here you got your fall. And then the trees are all bare in the winter. And you can actually follow the imagery around the outside as well. And you'll see the corn right here and the different species of animals you might see coming around during those times. Okay, second grouping of documents that we see are the historical references. This is an image from a document called the Florentine Codex. Um, it, it has a lot of daily life representations, um, a lot of Spanish translation of the image. So not only are you seeing individual words by the images, you're seeing a paragraph. This is what this image means. This has a lot of the um, roles that people play, um, like people that weave things and a lot of the rulers. Um, it actually shows how they made the headdress of Montezuma II, which is the big, 
big green one that most people think of when you say a headdress. Um, in this particular image, these little squigglies right here, anybody want to guess what they are? Anyone? These are actually indicating that these people are speaking. So it's essentially wind coming from their faces. Um, and you can see a little guy here. This also tells you what gender these individual are. Um, anybody want to guess on that one? These two are male because of the haircut. Females, you're gonna see two hair knots here, um, may or may not have straight bangs, and then a lump in the back like a bun. Um, this is obviously a male because of the, the beard, but you see the, the structure of his um, headgear is what you would consider nobility royalty. This is called a diadem. Um, he's all three of these gentlemen are wearing till motley, which are cloaks that tied at the corner. Um, and you can see his maxillatal, which is a loincloth, which is very typical for, for the men of the time just to wear a cloak and a loincloth. You can also see these mats. They wove mats to sit on right here. Um, the chair he's sitting on is most likely a wood chair, um, although there are a couple stone chairs that have been um, displayed. And he must be talking to them about some kind of either snake actual or a snake god. So you can derive a whole lot of information from some of these documents. Government records. I'm gonna tell you when I first learned about these, I was really surprised because I think a lot of people, their mind goes to, oh, it's a quote, primitive quote, culture. And they must not know a lot of things about math or taxes. Well, when you go into Codex Vergara, um, it shows you this farmer has a, uh, one house and three plots of land. Here's the house here, here's the house here. It shows you the shape of the plot of land and it tallies up what types of crops he's got, how many um, things he should be tithing slash sacrificing. Um, and you even have a little difference in the, the appearance because they're gonna try to um, make it look like the person that actually owns the house. Um, here's the Spanish up here as well, which I do not speak Spanish or read it very well, so I'm not sure what it actually is saying there. But this Codex Vergara, all the, all the way through it has maps of the villages, has um, almost like road maps, how to get to between them and what the land looks like. It's actually really um, specific. So if you're interested in those kind of things, this is, it has acreage calculations. I mean, things that you wouldn't think a culture like this would have. Okay, so these are our three main types of documents. So now we're get, gonna get into how they make them. So, the media that they would use is one of these. Um, the first is a model. A model is a paper, loose, loosely paper, made from um, the Amade tree. Um, and its most similar counterpart in modern paper is birch paper that is, um, not processed. So you're literally taking a piece of the birch tree. Uh, the second is animal hide. Um, Codex Borgia 
was deer, most likely. Um, they also used some of uh, the fibers from the agave plants to uh, crunch and make a, a more cottony look. Cotton was big for them. Some of them do have a wood or hide cover. Um, so that's what we're working on. Utensils, from information that I have found from several different libraries, they don't really have any extant pens or paint brushes or anything like that. They have a couple of the documents that microscopically have fur bedded in them, um, in the paint. And they think this is rabbit fur. It seems to be consistent with rabbit fur. If you know anything about rabbits, rabbit fur would make a good brush. It bends nice. Some of the hair is very sturdy. It's very soft. So you have a lot of different properties about that type of fur that would be beneficial to painting. Um, rabbit is plentiful. So that would be another reason that they would assume. So you take your media, whatever this media is, mostly 27 centimeters-ish to 40 centimeters-ish, and you put white lime on it, like a plaster. That's going to help prepare the surface. So for European cultures, we would think of pouncing um, for that process. The Codex Borgia and Codex Bourbonicus have the lime that was on it. So we know that, that there is uh, lime being used here. Now here's where it gets interesting, the paints. Um, they are mineral or vegetable. They are ground down. They're added to a gum material. And in the European cultures, we see that the gum Arabic was one of them uh, from the acacia tree. But here they don't have that. And so what they actually used was the pseudo bulbs from the orchid to get that uh, gum. They did actually have some acids and bases they would add to alter the color of those paints. Uh, similar to alum and um, things that you would use European style. So any questions before we go on? Because I'm going to talk about the individual paints next. Anyone, anyone, anyone? Okay. So really complex chart but I see better in charts and I'm a visual person. So this is the Aztec term for the color. Some of these I can pronounce. Caustic and on the next page, they'll probably be istacoustic. Those are your um, yellow and orange. Kiltic, yeah, blue, green. Um, Kiltic, here's your chocolatic. So if you want carbon black, that's going to give you black. Um, and all of these have been found from Raman spectroscopy and, and different kind of chemical processes and evaluations. We find that in the Florentine Codex as an example. Um, the clay color, which is white, we see in the Florentine Codex. The Mayan blue, Mayan blue is only in this area because it comes from a uh, mineral that is only in the um, underground structures in that area called palagorskite. So they crunch up this iridescent looking, think kind of bluish opal. They crunch that up and they add indigo to it. And that gives that kind of, um, kind of sky light blue but in the actual documents, when you look at those, there's a little bit of a, um, a sheen to it because of that iridescent nature. So the reason why um, 
someone on the earlier page guessed, you know, the cool colors, that's because this is everywhere there. It's plentiful. They make a lot of it. It's shiny. So a lot of the documents are going to have this. A lot of the pages are going to have this. Um, and they're going to use calcium carbonate to get yellow, orpiment to get yellow, cochineal to get scarlet, hematite and cinnabar to get red, um, a plant named anato to get red, uh, orpiment, indigo, and clay are going to get mixed to make green. And there's a darker green color and a more of a um, blue or green color. The bright blue um, that is not shiny is the vegetable pigment you see here. There was minimum used in the Florentine Codex. Um, cochineal, orpiment, and uh, calcium carbonate got you the orange color. Um, this is one of the orange color. The more um, kind of sienna color is the clay soil. And they retrieved chocolatique, which is brown tan, from the prickly pear fruit. The interesting thing about this is when I tried it, it made pink, like a rose pink. So my thinking is they probably added something to this to change the pH to bring it down to a, a tan brown color because that did definitely not make brown. The other portion of this chart, and yeah, we got it. So here are the um, individuals who ran some Raman spectroscopies and uh, determined what was there. Um, the Borbonicus is still undergoing um, chemical evaluation. I've been in touch with the um, Bibliothèque Nationale in France, and as of a few years ago, they're still running tests on it to figure out what all the different pigments are. But I also found it interesting that a lot of our European pigments show up here. And yeah, some of them are here, but I'm wondering if any of those would correlate to the Spanish scribes that are coming and then sharing materials. So we've talked about what we're drawn on. We're talked about what we're drawing with. So let's talk about what we're drawing. It really does depend on what type of document you have. Um, but what I did was I kind of gave some samples of each of the, the types of things you could see. It's not the only things you can see. It's just some common things. Um, sacred animals, gods and goddesses, buildings, plants, household items, weapons, um, anything is possible. But remember in the, in the calendar ones, we're having imagery that's specific to that month and that celebration, that ritual. In the other ones, you're gonna see more of accounts of this type of plant or this type of crop. You're gonna see the houses. So there's actually one document that gives the lineage of the ruling um, queens and emperors all the way down through um, the years and the, the um, centuries. So this is just one um, sampling of some of the things, uh, images, the crocodile, this is a hikado, that's wind, akali is a house, um, lizards, you can see them this color, you can also see them green, um, the quaddle is the snake, hence Quetzalcoatl. Um, this is the skull that similar to European cultures, represents death. Um, the deer, the rabbit. This is Adel, which is water. 
Um, this is East Queenly, which is dog. Um, this is your monkey. And actually the, the face paint I've got on today is for the gob that's associated with monkeys. So you see the red at the bottom, it's a red jaw. Um, this is grass. Um, a coddle is reed. Like think like a, a water, for lack of a better term, bamboo type reed. Ocelotl is a jaguar. The eagle here, the vulture. Uh, this symbol represent, represents motion. It's more of a verb than a um, noun. This is a flint. This you're going to use for fire. You're going to use for knives. You're going to use for spearheads. So this is going to show up quite a bit. This symbol is rain. And shoshetal is flower. Then on this side of this page, there's representations of numbers, simple numbers down here. So dots usually up until 10 to 20. At 20, you're gonna start running out of room for dots. So you go to flags. Eventually you're gonna end up with these tree looking things at 400. And then you're gonna go big at 8,000. Let's think about if you had to draw 8,000 of these little doodads, you'd use up all your paper. Um, so this up here, you can see the Spanish translations of the dates below. The little dots here correspond to this. So this seven has the little seven, seven dots. And then this dot goes with this thing to make the 144 here. Similar here, 144 and eight. There's nine and the 144 derivation and so forth and so on. These you're gonna see a lot in um, Codex Vergara as well as uh, there are some in um, Florentine Codex. So I've babbled for a bit. What kind of questions do you have or things you want to know? It doesn't, if I can answer it, I will. How do they use those symbols to read the story? I don't quite understand. Do you know what I mean? What, what most people, are saying about that is the high priests are really the ones who interpret the at least the calendar pages so they're going to be the ones that know how to read it what we do know is is kind of like they read from right to left but each page what it meant inside it is the interpretation is to the priesthood. As far as the, the dates and those things, those were mostly used in the counting for um, taxes and acreage. So you have to be trained how to read those things. So it's not like person A, B, C, off the street could come in and say, oh, this means this, this means this. Um, almost like a second language, if you will. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any questions? Anyone? Anyone? I have a question, I guess. Uh huh. Um, and I did step away, so I might have missed it. Um, the pigments and stuff that they used 
on mm -hmm. documents, how do they differ from the ones that they would use on their bodies? Well, I know some of them are the same. Um, the high priest, you, you know them in the documents because they take carbon black, lamp black, and cover their entire body with it. The white is also going to be uh, used chalky. Um, as far as the red goes, my guess on that is it's mostly clay because the red stuff, it could be cochineal, but the red stuff can be quite bad on your skin. Um, that's a good question. I know married women usually wear a yellow um, band across the nose bridge. Um, married royal noble women. Um, so I'm, I, I'm pretty sure they probably didn't put orpiment on their face. But I have not researched that far into to that. We know they did it. That's evident from all of the documentation. I hope that answered a little bit. Any other questions? Well, I am out there. Um, I can put my email in the chat. So if you ever are curious or want more um, Aztec information, just let me know and I can probably answer it or tell you where to go to get it answered. for listening to me babble. Thank you for teaching. This is cool. I, I personally don't know a lot about this, but it was fascinating. It, it's um, since the opening up, let's say, of the cultures you're allowed to study, quote, allowed, it's become more available to study. Does that make sense, kind of? Um, when I was starting to do this, it was still kind of, oh, that's not European. And how can you do that? Well, it used to say contact with Europe, and I'm pretty sure smallpox is contact, you know, but now it's, it's so many more things are open to, to study, you know? There are images of Aztec people in Spanish courts. You know, it, it's the time frame is is good. So, and you know, being that there's so few of us researching it, you know, I have all kinds of people emailing me for stuff, and I don't know the answer to all of it. But you know, it, it's it's something new, different, and and people seem to be receptive. Very cool. Well, like I said, there are two of us in the mid realm. Yep, there's two of us in the mid realm, eight and Kaid. Um, because there's a Mesoamerican recreation group besides us that do. Aztec and Mayan and all that, some of those are crossovers, similar to how we see crossovers with um, oh, Dagger here and a lot of other Hema and those types of things. Um, and there are a couple people um, in the East Kingdom looking at Incan, as to my knowledge. So I'm loving it. I, I said everybody that 
says something about, oh man, it's so hot. And the, you know, look at all these layers. I'm like, come to the new world. We have tank tops and mini skirts. <laughs> so. Thank you so much for letting me babble. And if anybody has anything they need to ask me or, you know, just send me an email. <laughs>